Welcome to the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine 2021 Cell and Gene State of the Industry Report and Sector Panel Discussion. I'm Janet Lambert, the CEO of the Alliance. Over the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'll give you an overview of the state of the sector as of the end of 2020. And then we'll have the pleasure of a panel discussion on what we should expect in 2021 with some of the key executives in the field. For those of you unfamiliar with ARM, we are the global voice of the gene, cell, tissue, and broader regenerative medicine sector. Our membership includes more than 370 members worldwide, and they include therapeutic developers, tool and service providers, major medical and academic research centers, and patient organizations. We are the only international advocacy group focused specifically on advanced therapies, and we work in the US and Europe on behalf of our membership to bring safe and effective medicines to patients. We do so by promoting clear and harmonized regulatory pathways, enabling innovative reimbursement models and patient access, addressing manufacturing barriers for these innovative therapies, and by educating stakeholders, including policymakers, patients, and the media. Our members are a large portion of the global cell and gene sector, which is growing rapidly. The number of therapeutic developers active in this sector worldwide continues to grow, and we're currently tracking more than 1,100 globally. About half of these firms are headquartered in the US, but you can see here, there are a significant number of developers in Europe, in Asia Pacific, and in Israel. In particular, in 2020, we saw a lot of growth for the sector in China, Japan, and South Korea. Before I delve deeper into the 2020 data, I wanna to pause to talk about the patients our sector exists to help. Those patients include Giovanni and Cecilia Price, who were born with metachromatic leukodystrophy, or MLD. Their sister, Lavinia, shown in the framed picture here, passed away from the disease in 2013. That's Cecilia holding the picture, and Giovanni is the boy with short hair in the middle of the picture. MLD causes progressive loss of mobility and sensation as well as intellectual decline. Historically, it's been a fatal disease, but Giovanni and Cecilia were able to participate in a gene therapy trial and continue to thrive 10 years later. Lib Meldi, the orchard gene therapy that has by all appearances cured Giovanni and Cecilia's MLD was approved in Europe in 2020 and was one of the most significant milestones of 2020 in the sector. In addition, we've seen several other approvals of life-changing therapies over 2020, including Tacardis, a CAR-T therapy for patients with severe type of lymphoma, Zolgensma, which saw additional approvals in new geographies, as well as Luxterna, which did the same. Motivated by families like the prices, researchers continue to embark on new trials. More than 100 new trials commenced in Q4 alone, bringing the current number of active regenerative medicine trials globally to more than 1,200. Overall, the trials are roughly equally divided between cell therapy, gene therapy, and cell-based IO. 152 trials are in phase three, supporting the EMA and FDA's oft-quoted predictions that there will be 10 to 20 advanced therapy approvals each year by 2025. Of the phase three trials, 72 are in gene therapy, and they're pretty evenly distributed across multiple indications. Here's a broader look at the trials across indications, including phase one, phase two, and phase three. And you can see they're concentrated in oncology, but for the first year, CNS is the second most prominent indication, followed by genetic diseases and the rest of the list you can see here.
The scientific and clinical developments in this sector are obviously going to be too numerous for me to summarize in this brief talk. Uh, but let me call out a few themes we see in the data that we use to track the sector. One, investors have bet strongly on cell-based IO for some time. IO trials make up now a third of all regenerative medicine trials and almost 50% of phase one trials. We saw in 2020 data readouts this year from a diversity of approaches, including promising clinical data in trials targeting BCMA and advances in programs focused on other non-CD19 targets and dual targets. And we saw increased focus in clinical data for allogeneic cell therapies with a growing application of gene editing approaches. 2020 was a very good year for iPSCs. Fate Therapeutics reported some positive data from their ongoing trials of iPSC-derived NK cell therapies, providing compelling inhuman evidence of the potential effectiveness of this therapeutic approach. Also this year, researchers published data from the first ever attempt to use iPSCs to treat Parkinson's disease showing increased dopamine and consequential functional improvements in patients out to 24 months. These and other developments are leading to increased activity in iPSCs, both auto and in particular allo, on the part of therapeutic developers, as well as CDMOs. Gene editing continued to advance in the clinic. This year, for the first time, a patient was treated with CRISPR-based therapy in vivo, and later, the first patient was treated systemically with CRISPR. CRISPR Therapeutics and Vertex shared some encouraging data from their sickle cell trial and announced this week that 20 patients have now been treated. And of course, all of that happened in a year when Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dudna received the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for discovery and development of CRISPR-Cas9. By the end of 2020, there was no doubt that gene therapy is an established modality with commercial products, a deep pipeline, strong support from large bio and pharma, and consistent investor enthusiasm. Nevertheless, we faced some of the challenges of advancing a still young science and sector in 2020 in areas such as dosing, delivery, and CMC. Gene therapies represent almost half of the phase three pipeline, so we should expect to continue to mature and learn as we move more products close to the commercial marketplace. In that vein, it's worth stating, making a penetrating glimpse into the obvious, which is that 2020 was a challenging environment for advanced therapy innovators. COVID created a number of operational and clinical disruptions. I think many of those disruptions were less than we might have at first anticipated, but truthfully, I think we don't know the full extent of the impact of the disruptions on clinical trials. We know that regulators were slammed with new and urgent COVID-related demands, and as a result, had less bandwidth for cell and gene therapy. We know and saw the politicization of COVID vaccine development and the challenges that that created for FDA leadership, including those involved in deliberations around advanced therapies. And lastly, of course, we continued to create growing demands and fast moving science that gave regulators a traditional set of challenges. This context, along with other factors, had a bearing on agency communication and decisions in 2020. Over the course of the year, we saw six programs delayed for CMC and manufacturing related reasons, and a number of others due to requests for additional data. That said, we also know that a number of positive developments happened, 
uh, thanks to our regulators, including 12 new RMAT designations in 2020. The record setting part of the year was definitely in financing. 2020 was an incredible year for investment in this space by any measure. Advanced therapy developers raised nearly $20 billion in 2020, shattering all previous records. That's more than double what was raised in 2019, about 50% more than was raised in 2018, the previous record year of financings. Gene therapy financing is up 73% year over year, and cell therapy financing is up 160% year over year. As you can see here, public financing was especially strong in 2020. Both follow-on financings and IPOs broke records. Follow-ons were up 28% from the previous record in 2018, and IPOs were nearly double the previous record set in 2018. Venture capital was also very strong and surpassed the previous record of $4.1 billion set in 2019, reaching $5.6 billion this past year. Fittingly, for this kind of record-breaking year, we've seen a number of very large financings. While in the past, we've included a list of all the financings of $100 million and greater, in this annual review, there were too many for us to fit on a chart this year, so we've had to reset the bar to $200 million and above. As you can see here, Sanabio led the pack with a $700 million raise in June. Follow-on financings were led by Iovance and Bluebird, but a number of significant follow-ons occurred and leading the IPO pack were Legend Bio and Passage Bio. Large Pharma and Bio continued to buy into the sector through research development, commercialization and licensing agreements with innovative developers. Areas of particular focus include oncology and nervous system disorders. Sangamo announced two major collaborations in neuro, and Bayer, as we'll hear more about in a minute, has been especially active. Overall, the level of large cap activity was very, very strong in 2020. Biotech sector stocks performed exceptionally well last year, but the regenerative medicine companies outperformed the NASDAQ biotech index. COVID-19 initially had a noticeably negative effect on performance, but those losses were quickly regained. And as you can see, publicly traded cell-based immuno-oncology therapy companies led the pack, closing out the year with an over 80% increase in stock performance. Gene therapy companies were close behind with a 70% increase. All publicly traded regenerative medicine companies, including gene therapy, cell-based IO, as well as other cell therapy and tissue engineering companies, saw about a 50% increase in performance in 2020. Policymakers and others were rightly uh, distracted by COVID and its associated challenges, but nevertheless, the sector actually managed a couple of significant policy wins in this tumultuous year. Medicare approved a new diagnostic related group or DRG for CAR T therapies, which will significantly improve the reimbursement for providers of CAR T therapies. CMS also finalized a rule this year that will allow state Medicaid programs to enter into outcomes-based arrangements for gene therapies, something we and many others view as essential for us to really achieve patient access to gene therapies. And lastly, the European Union published a pharma strategy 
which includes a number of components related to ensuring accessibility and affordability of medicines in the EU. The strategy will evolve over time and includes a number of components important to cell and gene therapy. But of note, the document recognizes the significant impact of cell and gene therapies on the patient landscape and we're encouraged that we can build on that starting point in our work with the commission. Looking ahead to 2021, we have already a number of regulatory decisions on the docket for the year. In the US, those decision, expected decisions include Mallinckrodt's tissue product for severe burns, Bluebird and Bristol-Myers squibs, CAR-T Idacel, BMS's CAR-T Lysacel for relapsed or refractory large B-cell lymphoma. And in Europe, expected decisions include the two CAR-Ts as well as PTC BIOS gene therapy for AADC deficiency, Gensite Biologics gene therapy for a form of inherited blindness, and Bluebird Bios gene therapy for cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy. All indications are that 2021 will be a fantastic year in science, technology, and clinical progress in this sector. And I look forward to hearing our panel talk further about their outlook for this space. I think at ARM, we're really focused intently on helping the sector overcome manufacturing challenges in cell and gene therapy, and you'll see us release quality by design best practice guides for both gene and cell therapy manufacturing in 2021. We'll all continue to address the social context of our work this year. I think we'll see in 2021 increased public-private efforts to enable N of 1 and ultra-rare therapies to safely and efficiently reach patients. Also, many of us have renewed commitments to achieving racial equality in the workforce and diversity in our clinical trials. In this regard, ARM has launched a new internship program to match black students with opportunities in our member organizations. And the first class of interns is set to begin this summer. Lastly, we obviously have a new policy environment for 2021 that will affect the commercial and regulatory conditions for the field and determine a lot about patient access. The new political and regulatory leaders across Europe and the US, together, we still have much to do to educate lawmakers about the special dynamics and the special promise of our field and to shape an effective policy environment for it. This is the number one priority for ARM in 2021. So with that, uh, let me thank you for your attention and uh, remind folks who are interested that the slides from this presentation will be available at the ARM website along with a number of other resources. And let me introduce um, a panel discussion. We have a number of really um, thoughtful leaders in this space to talk about what to expect for cell and gene therapy in 2021 and beyond. And I'm so uh, pleased that Terry Ann Burrell has agreed to be the moderator for this panel. Um, Terry probably has about as much JP Morgan experience as, as anybody, even if this is her first uh, virtual JP Morgan. Terry is TA, as she is known, is the CFO at Beam, but prior to Beam, she spent 11 years with J.P. Morgan, most recently as the Managing Director in the Healthcare Investment Banking Group. So with that, let me turn it over to T.A. Thanks, T.A. Thank you, Janet, and good afternoon to everyone who's joined us here today. Hope you are all having a very productive J.P. Morgan conference 
you know, I'd start by uh, thanking Janet and the entire team at ARM for facilitating this panel. Um, I, I really enjoyed her remarks, and I think it's indicative of despite the extraordinary operational and clinical disruptions that she touched on, I think we can all agree that 2020 was a pretty extraordinary year. Uh, technical and clinical advancements that will almost certainly improve the lives of patients, uh, a rapidly evolving regulatory environment, and of course, extraordinary investor receptivity and appetite for precision genetic medicines. Um, we have here an incredible panel, uh, and I'd like to first start by turning it over and having everyone quickly just introduce themselves. And uh, recognizing we have only 40 minutes, we're going to jump right in really to uh, focus in on what we all think is coming next. So maybe Sandy, I'll take it over to you. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. I'm Sandy. I'm the CEO of Sangamo. We are the Zinc Finger company and we are, we are driving forward genomic medicines. Ken? Thanks, T.A. I'm Ken Mills. I'm the president and CEO of Regenix Bio, which is an in vivo AAV gene therapy company, also focused on a diverse pipeline of internal programs and partnered with a lot of companies working in the AAV gene therapy space. Marianne? Yes, thank you, T.A. And, and thank you, Janet, for our excellent uh, introduction. That was really very, very good. Um, yeah, so my name is Marianne de Becker. I'm the head of strategy and business development at Bayer Pharmaceuticals. And as Janet already alluded to, uh, at the, during the course of last year, we have made uh, very significant steps to venture into new modalities by building a leading uh, gene uh, therapy and cell therapy platform. So we acquired Ask Bio. We entered into a collaboration with Atara, and those are obviously, you know, fundamental uh, building blocks of our overall cell and gene therapy strategy uh, that is complementing our, uh, our Blue Rock uh, uh, acquisition and also our collaboration with uh, Ultragenics in this field. So I'm looking forward to talk a bit more about all of that uh, during the panel discussion. And of course, a ad. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm Ad Rawcliffe. I'm the CEO of Adaptamine. Adaptamine is an engineered T cell therapy company, late stage, and we're looking forward to putting our first uh, engineered T cell product for solid tumors on the market next year. Brilliant. Thank you so very much. So maybe I will start and direct the first question to add. You know, on our pre call, we had a pretty robust discussion around where we are in the life cycle of precision genetic medicines. And maybe to you, if you share some perspectives on where you think we are and where you think we're going. So I think, I think uh, precision genetic medicines or cell and gene therapies as a whole uh, can be considered whether you're doing the genetic editing ex vivo or in vivo very much as a, as a, as a modality of therapy. They're defined by for me by the opportunity on a one-off basis to provide new or regain of function um, for a patient and to deliver durable or even curative responses. And, and that, that's the promise of cell and gene therapy broadly defined for me. And, and as a modality, I think it fits into you know, many of the other modalities that have come before. And there haven't been that many modalities, to be honest. But the one that I look to actually is biopharmaceuticals. Uh, I, think, I think what's happening in the cell and gene therapy space, uh, what has happened in the last decade and probably what will happen in the next decade if I was a betting man, would be uh, analogous to what happened in, in biopharm. Uh, and where are we in that setting? Well, we haven't had any really true blockbusters launch yet, not, not products with mass appeal perhaps at this point in time. So maybe we're pre-Rituxan. Um, which is 1997, I believe, but we're definitely past the first monoclonal on the market, which was OKT3 and 86. So we're somewhere uh, probably in the early or mid 90s in the biopharm revolution. Um, and I think that's consistent with the fact that um, yeah, the, the potential has been seen, particularly by some of the, uh, some of the companies. Um, and there's a lot of investment in the space, um, but we're yet to convince everybody uh, and there's still an awful lot of hard work to convert 
uh, what are amazing technologies into products that impact patients' lives on a global scale. I appreciate that. And, and you know, there are two things that I, I want to follow up on there. One, and I'll start with the first, which is really a question around valuation, right? You, you mentioned that, you know, we may be past that first monoclonal antibody, and I'd love to get others to chime in. We've seen, and Janet talked about this, just enormous valuation growth across the entire space, uh, broadly defined this year. If we really are in that, you know, first phase, you know, where monoclonals were, and we can all think back and, and remember what valuations were in the market then, you know, to me, you sort of suggest that there is a lot of room left to grow from an investor interest valuation perspective. I'm certainly curious, you know, what others, uh, Ken and Marianne, even from your strategic lens, you know, what you think around, you know, what the valuation potential looks like in this space broadly and how you think about that from a strategic perspective. Shall I go first? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, what we fundamentally believe that, you know, the traditionally used modalities, right, uh, fall short in, 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 in coming up with solutions for many diseases, right? So, uh, particularly those caused by undruggable proteins, multifactorial diseases, gene defects. And here we have, you know, modalities that really allow us to treat diseases at its roots. So, you know, it's only logical that, you know, the level of enthusiasm is, uh, is increasing the level of, uh, you know, financing that is going to this space is significantly increasing. And, you know, we truly believe that this is an area that will dramatically al alter the standard of care for, for multiple conditions. And that's, of course, the reason why we made such significant investments over the, over the course of last year for example, in acquiring uh, OSBIO for $4 billion. Um, but when we th were thinking around valuation, um, you know, we also tried to see how can, we s how can we think about structures that are really going to create aligned incentives with our partners. Um, for example, the acquisition of OSBIO is a structured deal. Um, and, you know, we pay $2 billion up front, but we have another $2 billion that is going to materialize for the partner, uh, you know, based on really achieving aligned incentives. So we, we try to really focus uh, our partner on creating value, uh, and that is related to achieving certain, you know, obviously clinical milestones, technological milestones, manufacturing, uh, uh, and others are making in this field. There's a lot of innovation yet to come. Um, and it's going to continue to be a, a real seller's market for, you know, for probably many, many years to come. Yeah, I would add um, to what Marianne said by addressing the growth piece, TA, where I think that the, the breadth that Marianne described of the tools that are available in precision medicine, genetic medicine, cell and gene therapy, is fantastic and, and transformative um, clinically. And I think it's established. Uh, I think that an area of growth for this platform, as I think Ad was alluding to, is larger indications. And, and um, you know, I, we have experience with that at Regenix Bio and trying to you know, move into hundreds of thousands, millions of patient population uh, areas with you know, the same fundamental technology that has proven itself to be really strong in tens and hundreds of patients. Um, but I think that's a, a, an important area of growth. And you know, for example, in our lysosomal storage disease programs where we're focused on CNS manifestations, we see that technology carrying us through to things like uh, dyskinesia and dementia, which are you know, in, in a different spectrum in terms of uh, patient unmet need populations. Um, so I see that growth potential there in a, in a phenomenal way. And back to the first question, just on, on Ad's point, which I think is a great one to anchor ourselves, but let's think about you know, how many more tools and resources there are today, not just capital, but where cell and gene therapy was picking up foundationally after the genome sequencing with you know, 
many, many more tools. I think we're accelerating along that growth curve in a much faster way than traditional biologics were able to with the tools that they had. And, and we've got great brain power as well, which is really exciting. Certainly, I appreciate that. I, I want to pick up a, a couple of threads, Ken, from you and, and also give Sandy a chance to comment here. You know, what do you say? Gene therapy broadly has faced some challenges uh, this year to sort of pivot to those larger and larger indications. You know, what sort of technological and regulatory advances do we need to sort of make that pivot uh, as we go forward? So I, I, I want to be a little provocative here because I, I think um, we're, we're, I think what Adrian says is important that there will be, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a simple physician, there will, there will be three forms of medicine. There will be small molecules to treat something, small molecules or monoclonals to treat something. There will be vaccines to prevent something. And then there'll be genomic medicines to prevent something and to, to adjust something and to make sure it doesn't happen. And those are the three modalities that if we come back into this panel in 10 years time, that we'll be talking about as established ways to address disease. Gene therapy is great, but it's only a transient place that we're passing through. It's only a place that we're going to the liver because that's where we go. And, and uh, the number of diseases that are in the liver that are tractable and have large enough patient populations that you can treat and take forward is tiny. It's, there's 7,000 diseases in the liver. There's about 20 that are, are big enough. And all the companies are going to the same place. The future isn't gene therapy. It is long-term editing and changes to the genome that allows the patient to uh, walk away from their disease and leave, lead a normal life. And I think that's what we all need to be aiming for. The... Uh, regulatory environment, we're often asked about the regulatory environment. Peter Marks and Sieber are doing a great job and we should be so pleased with how uh, flexible and innovative they've been. But we've, we're moving now from a time when uh, it's all about the science to now it's about clinical results and about each one of us producing clinical data. And once you start to produce clinical data, nobody cares about which form of science that produced it. All they care is, does it make a difference to the patient? Does the patient feel better or live longer? And that's the way it should be. And so as we're all throwing up our hands to complain about um, challenges to our dream programs, it's simply because we now have to show that they work and show that they work in patients. So three fundamental things. This is the future. The future is beyond the liver and the future is determined by showing clinical efficacy. Yeah, and if I may just add to that, uh, TA, as, as you know, Ken, uh, I believe was saying, right? I mean, we are moving to these uh, much more broader diseases, right? Pathway diseases, polygenetic diseases. Uh, I mean, the acquisition of, of you know, us bio has allowed us to venture uh, with an AV-based platform into Parkinson's disease, a chronic heart failure. Uh, so the potential is obviously much bigger than, than, than just monogenetic diseases. Um, but to the point that was made, right? I mean, there's, there's so many different modalities that come at our disposal at this moment in time. And from a big pharma perspective, what we have decided to do is to focus into a, a number of different areas, right? And really place our bets across a number of different platform, so to speak. I mean, while we are very heavily into uh, gene augmentation now, we're also very heavily invested into, uh, you know, a stem cell platform with Blue Rock, and we are very uh, much investing into um, a, a, an oncology cell therapy platform, uh, for example, through an, a collaboration with Atara Biosciences. And of course, we are very strongly looking into uh, gene editing and, and, and exploring a lot of things there. So I think you know, a diversified portfolio in this space, if you're a larger company, is also um, important and allows you, you know, to, to, to make sure that you can capture value across sort of the, the overall um, uh, field and you're not, you know, placing all your 
your bets in uh, in one basket. Thanks, Marianne. I do want to give Ken a chance because Sandy did say something that was pretty provocative, right? Around and how do you, how does G as a representative of a gene therapy company, Ken, um, how do you think about sort of that move towards gene editing, and how do we, how does gene therapy continue to prepare to to play, and what's the role for gene therapy as the science continues to evolve? Yeah, um, lucky for me, I've participated on panels with Sandy before and been able to share our provocative thinking together. Um, and we agree on many points. And I agree a lot about the direction he's talking about how things are going. And what I can layer into it is, um, you know, it's also important to recognize that we have problems and solutions today and that there are patients today that need treatments and in that 7,000 you know, no diseases in the liver, and of course there's other tissue targets where we're having success. We can deliver things in the next three to five years that are incredibly meaningful and have, and I, I know we all agree on that. Another, you know, angle, and I think this relates a little bit to the thinking that goes on at Regenix Bio, you know, that, that small molecule category is an interesting one still, Sandy, and I think it's, you know, these multifactorial diseases where we don't understand all of the genetics, won't know what, where, and how to edit, yet still have therapeutic alternatives, you know, and, and we can convert them into biologics and maybe deliver them on a one-time basis instead of chronic administration with toxicities and other things that are questionable. It is an interesting role, I think, for, you know, what I think of as AAV gene therapy, really delivering therapeutics with a one-time mm -hmm. administration. So, I mean, I, I, I love that, you know, we're so inspired by, um, you know, again, the, the genome, gene editing, these phenomenal technologies. I, I believe in that future as well. And along that pathway and for decades, there are gonna be opportunities for all of these modalities to add important and long-term value. And at the end of the day, um, you know, there's also the intersection of gene editing and things like AAV delivery that are necessary as well. So um, it's, it's fun to talk about, important. You know, I, I have tended as, as the, you know, in my short tenure here in gene therapy, to try to focus on getting as many patients treatments as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's um, our brand of gene therapy. Yeah, I well said. Completely, completely okay. agree with that. I, I, I'd, I'd link that back actually to the starting point, Terry. Um, you know, it, it, is a, it is a truth that the only thing that creates value in our industry is benefit to patients. And actually it doesn't do it when we develop the data, it does it when we commercialize the product. So actually it's only commercial products on the market actually being made available to patients that really creates value. It's the point where the patient gets value in that setting. And everything else up to that point is a surrogate for the uh, proximity and probability of that happening. So let, let's just accept that, that sort of truism. The, the, and this has been true and it will be true for us. And you talk about valuation, Terry, on and where the valuations are going and whether they're over or under, whether there's still lots of headroom. I, I just come back to every time I look at a successful company, the hockey stick really, however highly you think they were valued, the hockey stick really begins as they get to actually put products on the market. And my, my you know, take the long view of this, um, my, my um, poster chart for that is look at the all-time chart for Insight, which actually yeah. has a very young business development uh, associate in uh, at GSK when I first joined. It was the first company that I looked at and we thought they were massively overvalued. And they were because they had a technology. Um, they didn't have any products and it took them 20 years. Um, but it, And it took them the evolution away from a technology company to a product company and putting products on the market to actually see that. And it, I, I think that's a illustration of what will happen in, in the cell and gene therapy space. Until we're putting products on the market, you won't really see the value creation that we believe can, can the industry can aspire to. Yeah, I certainly think we all agree on that. But TA, another important point that Sandy made that I want to backstop is Peter and the FDA and, and the EMA as partners in the work they're doing and in the backdrop of COVID and them being involved in the review of vaccines, amazing partners focused on the right things and in the right way and to sandy's point and we need to do our jobs 
I was actually going to ask about that, right? Because it does seem, I'm not a scientist by training, but so outside from looking in from that perspective, but also being on the inside now at a company, the technological advancement and the pace of that just is torrid. How does a regulatory environment keep up with that so that you can fast track therapies to patients and especially in a precision genetic universe where you know if it works uh, generally you, you have a better sense about whether or not it's going to work you know quicker than you would in a small molecule world so can i take a go at that because it's a very different world. I, you know i did 20 years with adrian even um looking after small molecules and and the old fashioned type of medicines. And between ideation and IND, you lost about 90% of the products through toxicology, distribution, uh, absorption. With our products, they, they don't die. They, once you have an ID, you can usually get them all the way to IND. And the first time that you test them is when they get into the clinic. So that's why I really do believe you need to be absolutely certain of what you're doing in the clinic, because that's the only time that you, your products will be sifted through. The agency, I, I agree, I think they're doing a fantastic job, but it's um, the, the rate of rise of this industry is phenomenal. When I started in 2016, I went to ASGCT and it was filled with people in check shirts and ponytails, the men. And um, it's only in the subsequent years that the suits started to turn up. And now when you look at gene therapy, it's filled with all the big pharma companies and it really is seen as a core part of their business. That's why Sangamo has got six blue chip pharma companies as our, as our partners. That in itself is a biomarker of the uh, mainstream establishment of, of genomic medicines as a future. But Adrian is, is so right that we have to show clinical data, we have to get it over the line, and the agency always asks reasonable questions. They ask for um, data that they can put in a label, and they look at for reproducibility and um, clear signs of efficacy and safety. And I would argue that the, the companies that have, come, that have complained about the agency recently haven't had re reproducible data. They haven't had data that, that meets those two well-controlled study type challenge. And so all the excitement of being preclinical, all the valuation of being in a company that doesn't have anything in the clinic and has a $5 billion market cap is, uh, comes to reality when it puts something in the clinic. I'd, 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 I'd add one piece to that, which is I think uh, the agency in, in some respects is learning at the pace of the industry as well, how to, mm. how to think about these, which pieces of data are particularly important. If I just narrow it down to sort of cell, cell therapy, our, our little space, you know, we've seen as we've been through the uh, discussions with, uh, with the agency, the, the, the impact of something that happens over here very quickly Yet another company comes back and it's okay. symptomatic of the fact that that they're actually learning at the same time that we are what's important what that how how do the assays really need to work for a cell therapy that you're going to be giving to patients how's that different for a till versus a uh, an engineered uh, cell therapy etc and so I, I think i think that's actually although that's that means that uh the bar actually is shifting does shift it also means that there's actually a resource there um, from the discussions with the agency uh, in terms of where the ball is going. And, and I, I think the worst thing that we can do is stick, is stick your head in the sands and think that the agency won't continue to require the things that they've always required in order to approve a drug and think that we're somehow special in that regard. No, you need to produce the data. And, and the, the difference for us in our little subsection is 80% of that is actually CMC uh, discussion. And actually, to Sandy's point, only 20% of that is, is clinical data because the clinical data is actually relatively e earlier, to, earlier to occur, happens in smaller numbers because of the size of the signal. 
and Simon, that you're beyond not being special, the ball is moving. So to some degree, it sounds like being a pioneer in the space is almost more challenging than being a follower, right? Having that path carved for you to some degree. Well, we, we are definitely happy that we are following the approval of the first two CAR T products. It has been hugely valuable for us. Except, except, it, except, you know, if you're the second, so if you were second to market or third to market with an SSRI, you could persuade people to switch. If you're second or third to market with a gene therapy, they've had it and it's once and done. Yeah, and so I don't so think I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that if you're talking about, um, particularly as well, if you're talking about the same mechanisms of action as well. Yeah. Um, but, but I think if you're talking about stuff that relates to the platform, there's a lot of read across the different drugs and using using okay. similar platforms or assays. And and because in our space, a lot of the discussion is platform oriented, it's incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that's Wait, the, Go ahead, Marianne, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, I mean, that's actually the reason why, you know, what, what, what we are trying to do as a big pharma company that hasn't been traditionally in this field is really, you know, find the pioneers in the field, right? And really try to, to acquire or work with, with, with the very best in the industry, because we have come to realize during this uh, process over the past year, I mean, for example, AAV therapeutics are uh, very complex drugs, right? I mean, the, the components, uh, the capsid, the promoter, the transgene, the manufacturing process. I mean, uh, I think maybe for people that are not familiar with the field, uh, people might think, oh yeah, you just take, you know, an AV8 or 9 capsid, you insert a transgene, you choose your promoter and you're ready to go. But of course, it's, it's extremely complex and a lot of these things um, have an interplay. And so, um, in, in the case of Ask Bio, for example, I mean, we have people who really excel at each, you know, of these components. We have people who excel at knowing everything about capsid design. And we have people who excel at everything that's related to the promoter design or to, you know, the optimization of expression and the, the interaction between the capsid and the promoter. And then, of course, everything related to scaling up manufacturing. Uh, but those people can also help a lot in the conversations with the authorities and in really helping to educate, right? Because they have learned over decades, you know, falling uh, and, and getting up again, learning from, from mistakes. So I think, um, you know, getting just the, the very best talent with a lot of expertise is, uh, I think, in, incredibly, incredibly important. And Marion, you were going sort of exactly where I was going to go. Um, you described a very holistic view of the broader space. You, from my perspective, we've seen a lot of strategic activity in gene therapy specifically, and you know certainly in the IO field as well. But I wonder how much farther and deeper, especially as we go you know, more into gene editing and uh, RNAi and just a lot of these big platform ideas, insertional technologies and the like, you know, what does it take for, and I think everybody on this panel has worked at a large cap company, you know, what does it take for large cap to really get motivated to take some of these technology risks? Yeah, I would say just from our perspective, as I said in the beginning, I mean, we, we want to address certain unmet medical needs that are just not addressable today with the modalities that we had on board, you know, until a year or two years ago, right? And so this whole biological revolution that is happening is, is really, you know, helping us to, to tackle diseases in a, in a new way. And as I said in the beginning, really also come up with, with truly you know, curative or, or regenerative therapies. And that's, that's really the promise of, you know, this uh, one step, go and cure. I mean, it's, it's something unbelievable as to the value that you can bring to patients. And, uh, you know, and, and it's, of course, a high risk, uh, but, you know, there's also um, the prospect of, of a high reward. Uh, but as I mentioned, also, we do try to diversify. So we try to diversify across you know, gene editing, gene therapy, uh, stem cell therapy, and, 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 and CAR-Ts and the likes. 
So we try to go broad in, in, that, plat in that broader platform uh, play of, uh, of, of cell and gene therapies in general. Uh, you look like you wanted to add to that. I'm not sure if Sandy or others can. No. Can, can you, you, you and I both partner with big companies and it, it becomes part of, part of your DNA, doesn't it? It's, it's essential to fund the company and it also um, it provides validation that if they've crawled over your data, it's so much more important than the CEO standing up and trumpeting the advantages of the technology. That's right. Great. It's, um, it's certainly validation. And, you know, I, I think TA, when, when you ask what, I mean, th from that lens, Sandy, right, what, what are they looking for, you know, and what has caused people to move to provide that validation and want to carry the water? And, you know, I, a lot of it is about trust in, you know, what, what underpins, you know, the safety and the capability set that we have built, Sandy, right? That, and that they can continue it and feel confident that that foundation is something that they can build off of trust-wise. And even if I reflect back on, you know, I think what we've all needed to do and need to do at this stage with the regulators, it's a lot about trust. You know, talking about building the expertise and the science expertise and the manufacturing expertise and the clinical expertise with these types of modalities in our companies, it's impossible to expect that Peter has recruited all of that same talent to receive that information right now. Uh, I, I fr frankly add, I remember, you know, hearkening back to, you know, antibody and biologics development, you know, talking, having a real conversation several years ago with a former commissioner of FDA who was enlightening to me about how behind he felt the you know, workforce was at FDA when biologics were rising, right? He's like, I need to recruit people that understand what antibodies are because they just know small molecules yeah. here at FDA. And, you know, happily, we have people like Peter and, and Janet and others who really know this. And, you know, and Peter, of course, has worked in industry and, you know, is a great partner in that. Trust is essential and it, it's a great channel, I think, for us to work with the larger companies who may not have the expertise but are building it like the way Marianne has described. And, and I love your point, Sandy, about it provides us tools and resources to continue to do what we do as well. Are there tools missing, right, to ensure that we are fully exploiting these technologies on behalf of patients, right? If you had to sort of have that one wish. Delivery. It's delivery, and, and if, if uh, Ken can come up with a vector that takes us to other places, you know, um, we'll work together. And, you know, if, if you could get us to the heart or to the, um, to the lungs or to the kidney, there are so many diseases that could be addressed, either with gene therapy for now or editing in the future. But it's, it's simply about how we get there, and that's where we all need to to uh, make the investment. And the reason companies like Adrian's are, are so successful is because they can do what they need to do outside the body and it's simpler. And then, uh, whereas what we have to do, uh, we have to deliver it to each cell to really make a difference. That will be solved. I mean, and that is just the, uh, the bright light in the future that we all need to look forward to because when it's solved, this technology all of our technologies can be applied to so many different diseases. Sometimes joke with our team that if we could just teleport everything to the spaces we needed to get it to, <laughs> it would be a lot easier Easy. for all of us. It's probably easier to invent a teleport. Your answer is a teleporter. <laughs> Sounds like you need some physicists. Um, I noted, and this is a pivot as we're coming up on time, but I noted in Janet's slides, you know, venture capital funding in 2020 uh, was almost $6 billion. So as I think about the number of companies that went public in 2020, right, that VC capital is that pipeline into the public market. You are there things that you are hoping to see from a technology 
perspective to come out of some of the some of these places that would help us right sandy mentioned delivery and and that is something that i wholeheartedly agree with in my plebeian world but um are there other things that you expect to be coming out from some of these early stage companies that could be transformative for the space and for patients So I, I, I'll, have a, I'll have a stab, and this is a narrow stab from our perspective. Um, uh, the, I think what's happening in, in our cell therapy space is that there are a lot of companies being formed who have a piece of the puzzle, um, yeah. a, a small piece of the puzzle. Um, and the, there's a lot, there's, some, there's a, an amount of value that's associated with that. And the, the key question is that they're asking is, what does, this, what does this particular piece do? And having answered it, there's a sort of bifurcation. Um, and earlier on, I think you could translate a piece of the puzzle into a platform into potentially a long-term company. I'm not sure that's true in our space anymore. Oh. I, think, I, think, I think the world is shaking out. And so mm -hmm. I think a lot of the investment in early stage companies is going into um modules that will ultimately either get spread across everybody because they're ubiquitously useful of thing or will get picked up by in what i think of as integrator companies um and i think the integrator companies in our space are going to shake out in a reasonably short period of time the next few years i see you know, it'll be established who has products who has a pipeline there'll be large pharma companies with a focus in this space that have that and there'll be standalone biotech companies um, they're the focus in the space to have that and not that there will never be consolidation within those but then I think there's a there's a massive wave of consolidation coming because it is untenable for this billion that has gone into those companies to result in that multiplied by whatever the return on capital worth companies actually becoming fully integrated companies after that. Yeah I would just add uh, TA that I mean the fact that there's so much VC funding, uh, you know, going into this space obviously bodes extremely well, right, for the, the future. And, and if you look at, and, and I think a lot of these uh, companies are going to be harboring pieces of a puzzle of, you know, technology that is going to be relevant in our different things, right? I mean, to give you an example, Asbio is also, you know, a collection of different companies that Shira Mikaela, the CEO, brought together, for example, Simpromix, she acquired that company because they had very specific synthetic promoter technology that allowed these, you know, on and on switches, which are going to be potentially very important for, you know, safety. And she acquired BrainVexis, which allowed her to venture into the Parkinson space. I mean, they have tropism factors that can target the heart. I mean, that was all through making really smart collaborations and, and acquiring some smaller players. And I absolutely agree, uh, you know, that there's going to be more consolidation. However, on the other hand, and, and we, we experienced it firsthand, right? There's so much opportunity for all these companies, to your point, to go IPO, that when we want to partner, we now not just have other big farmers as competition. Now we also have the IPO path as, as competition, right? So as, you know, larger players in this uh, field, we really have to, you know, elevate our, our game and, and make sure we are attractive because there's so, so much capital available and so many other, you know, ways to, to secure funding for those companies to progress their science. Thank you very much. I, I certainly appreciate that. I know we're at the top of the hour, but if I wanted to just quickly ask any predictions from each of you for 2021 for the space generally anything a little pixie dust specific predictions for 2021 beyond 2020 is yeah. a real taking taking a real um shot at my ability to predict much of anything TA. <laughs> Certainly testing our adaptive capacities as leaders. <laughs> and uh, I think it'll Absolutely. continue to test our adaptive limits. Uh, Indeed. Well, thank you all very much. I learned a ton. Uh, it was a pleasure spending time with all of you. 
best of luck for the rest of the conference and I'll turn it back to Janet. For some reason, uh, I'm unable to uh, to video again. So let me just uh, to verbally say thank you to TA and the whole uh, panel for a terrific discussion. I'm sorry we didn't have time to take questions, um, but we did what we could by uh, by text. And um, I wish everyone a really uh, a successful rest of the JP Morgan conference. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you.